Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Michael Tavernier, and I'm a consultant with the Bureau of Special Education at the Connecticut State Department of Education. Welcome. We're very excited to see all of you here. It's a very large group. We're kind of packed in here, but it's going to be a great day. I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague from CERC, Mr. Stephen Prophet. He has a few announcements before we get started. Steve. Thank you, Mike. It's great seeing everyone here today for our 14th annual meeting. Um, I hope that you're, we hope that your first couple of weeks have started off well, and we know that you're in for a great morning. Just a few um, announcements. We have some great information tables right outside in the hallway. So if you haven't visited them, you take, please take an opportunity to visit them during the break. We have CPAC represented, CERC represented. There's some great information flyers and professional learning flyers available for you that you can mark your calendars with. If we can, we ask that you put your cell phones on mute. We know that you're all incredibly busy. There's a lot of probably issues that you're dealing with, but if you can put them on mute, that would be great. And as you see, we have a videographer in the back of the room. Our whole morning session will be recorded, and once it's all edited and closed captioned, it'll be posted on the document link that you all have. All right, so we are in for a great morning, and thank you so much for your participation. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our very hardworking Deputy Commissioner, Ellen Cohn. Ellen? Good morning, everyone. I started my career in special ed, but you know you're getting old when you come back to an event and you don't recognize as many people as you used to. Um, I want to just start, first of all, welcoming you and also thanking you for all of your efforts in the field of special education. Special education directors, special education teachers, related school staff, you have some of the hardest jobs in education. Uh, hats off to you. I started my career as a social worker, so the work that you do is near and dear to my heart, and I just want to thank you for all of your efforts. And wow, do you turn out for an annual event. Bravo. So hopefully we'll get seats for everyone in the room and make sure that everyone's comfortable. You've got a jam-packed agenda going forward, so I won't take too much time, but I would like to first relay greetings from the Commissioner of Education, Dr. Diana Wenzel, and I wanted to share with you a few updates from the State Department of Ed. First and foremost, it goes without saying, these are unprecedented challenging times. Thank goodness for federal funds at this point, because I believe we're in day 76. Is anyone else counting? 76 of a budget impasse. Our legislature is coming in tomorrow, so we're hoping that we will land on a budget. Either way, government as we've known it in the past, is dramatically changing. The Department of Education is currently operating at about a 36% vacancy rate. We like to say that we're small but mighty. We have people doing just yeoman's work in terms of trying to keep, as the commissioner would say, buses running on time and the trains moving. That said, uh, the size of government will indeed shrink as a result of this budget deficit. While we can't look out too far into the future, we know the landscape in Connecticut is changing. Our revenues are down, employment and new businesses. We had some bad news about a large pharmaceutical company moving out of state yesterday. The landscape is certainly changing, and it's a little bit grim at the moment, but as an eternal optimist who typically gets beat down through the course of every day, <laughs> but pops back up each morning, I believe that we will get through this, and Connecticut's best days are probably still ahead of us. And so during these challenging times, it's critically important for us in the department to continue to communicate with you, to continue at the very least to provide the best possible customer service that we can. We may not be able to deliver the same services we've been able to in the past, but I have to give a particular shout out to the Bureau of Special Education, both the clerical staff and the consulting staff, who are getting smaller and smaller in terms of the number of them by the month, but they have worked tremendously hard to make this event possible with our partners at CERC, and they do amazing work every day. So if you just take a moment really for, for 
our staff to just give a moment of applause, please. If you've ever been in a jam in, in district, as I know I certainly have in the past, it sure feels good to be able to pick up the phone and call your contact at the department and to get advice, support, or other resources that you need. We will do our very best and we're dedicated to you to make sure that that happens. I want you to know that other big news from the department, other than budget, which is mostly bad news these days, is our ESSA plan, the reauthorization of what was formerly known as No Child Left Behind, has been reauthorized, um, I'm sorry, has been approved by the US Department of Ed, effective August 15th. And what does that mean for um, folks in district? It means that we have a much more forgiving, much more supportive plan in place than in the days of No Child Left Behind. We picked two battles that we were going to fight with the department. The first battle was um, our growth model. We've worked incredibly hard because we heard repeatedly from the field for over 10 years that growth wasn't counting, that people were just looking at status measures on tests, and we were prepared to fight with the Department of Ed on that. The good news is, is the Department of Ed has accepted our growth model in our accountability system. So every student's growth, if we start to focus on growth, every single student that grows gets points that go into the accountability system. If you remember under the No Child Left Behind days, if you didn't make the bar and you fell short, it was all or nothing. Now every point counts. It also means we, we are discouraging districts and urging districts to not teach to the test. Smarter Balanced was designed as an overall global measure of where students are, not a test that you should be preparing for all year. Teach to the standards, not to the test. And so what I saw under No Child Left Behind is often students that struggled the most were actually the ones that were left behind. This plan will actually put in place like I said, growth for each and every student should be our focus. No matter how low they are, no matter how far behind the curve they are. The other thing I wanted to share with you is we now have an electronic application system for grants at the uh, Department of Education in Hartford. We are the 49th out of 50 states to have an electronic system. We just couldn't bear being 50th. So it is a very big deal. You will find in two years' time, this year, the three title grants are going on that electronic application. Next year, Perkins and a number of state grants will go on that application system. And the following year, I believe that's 1920, IDEA, your grants, will go on that system. It speaks to and communicates with our prepayment grant system. So you'll continue to use that after the application process. But you will actually be able to use this platform to communicate with reviewers, to revise your application, to go back in, and there'll be very fast, instantaneous communication. As a person who often drove a hard copy three sets of applications to the department, I think you'll agree with me that mailing or driving it in is not the most efficient way in this, our 21st century. So we're pretty pleased. We definitely were not last, so that's a good thing, and I'm a glass half full kind of girl, so there you have it. I wanted to speak a little bit about legislation that was passed during our last session. First of all, the implementer bill, the things you learn when you move to Hartford and work for the state. The implementer bill will be coming out if we get a budget. And that will likely have a tremendous amount of legislation in it as well, okay? So for all intents and purposes, the legislation, legislative session of, of uh, 2017 is not completely over. But there were some, and I wanna speak to one piece of legislation in particular, because I want people to just hit the pause button. If you'll recall, there was legislation, and we've got a tremendous number of calls about it, about teachers taking a practicum in reading. And I see some nods, so people have heard about this. And it says that all three levels of certification, initial, provisional, and professional. It is a lovely piece of legislation and very well intended. 
we've we've hit some snags in implementation. Particularly, how do you how do you have a teacher who's working in the field uh, take a practicum? There's no such thing as a standalone practicum. It's not like you can go to the University of Hartford and take a reading practicum, not courses, not as part of a greater body of study. So I'm asking people to just push the pause button button momentarily. We're working with the drafters of the legislation and we're gonna work out what's a sensible approach going forward. So if nothing else, I wanted you to know that there's nothing for you to do at this time. And hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, I think that's it in terms of updates. What I do have the pleasure of being able to do is introduce our new bureau chief, Brian Klimkowitz. We, after the departure of Isabelina Rodriguez, who I believe is very happy, we've heard from her and she's very happy in her new role at a justice charter school closer to her home outside of Springfield, Mass. When Isabelina left, um, my greatest concern as the supervisor for that area was that that position would go unfilled. All of you re remember that we had giant vacancies for a very long time in this area. I feel like we hit the lotto. Brian has deep, practical, real um, experience and expertise. I see a lot of nods. The guy certainly has street credibility and a lot of um, admiration from his peers. So I feel like we hit the jackpot in hiring Brian. Um, he has tremendous experience. Many of you may know him from his roles as, most recently, the assistant superintendent in Plainfield. Before that, a role at Woodstock Academy as the Director of Social, Serv uh, Social Student Services, and uh, also as his time as Special Ed Director in Canterbury. But his role really goes all the way back to paraprofessional. So this is someone, and I always love these stories, where someone has sort of walked the walk, talked the talk. He's really known about special education from just about every perspective you could have. And so for that, I'm deeply grateful. In addition, he's just a really wonderful guy, and he's calm and has a sense of leadership and integrity that's really a North Star for the department. And I know I joined the rest of the Bureau of Special Education in welcoming him, and I'd like to introduce him now. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, your wisdom and guidance in my transition has been invaluable, so I really appreciate that. I'm so excited to be here this morning. It's really surreal to be standing up here uh, instead of sitting beside you at the tables, but I just want to let you know that I'm standing behind you in the work that you do moving forward this year, so thank you. I'd like to start off by saying that across the state, we are all feeling the financial crunch right now and the budget the way it is. And it's certainly deflating that as of September 13th, we do not have a state budget passed yet. But perhaps the most telling sign of the dire financial times is the fact that you have me for a keynote speaker here before you this morning. <laughs> but I do come free, so I'm cheap. So that's some savings there. But I don't mean to make light of the uh, crisis because I know we're all facing challenging times. It's so uplifting and refreshing to see everybody here this morning. I've been coming to back to school for the past 12 years, and it's really the start of the school year for special education. Sitting, uh, there's a, a weird phenomenon with this many directors in the same room together. Not in a bad way, it's just, it, it rarely happens, but it's a chance to talk to colleagues and get, get together and catch up, so it's always been a, a really special day for me. Um, so, I, I, I wanted to mention that uh, hearing the important information today, we have all of the usual activities that are happening today uh, from the consultants, uh, a year's worth of information packed into 10 minute segments, so that is coming. And I just wanted to mention that the educational consultants are really super. I'd like to welcome all the new directors in the room, and I wanna thank you for choosing to be a special education leader. For retired directors that are happy not to be here today or in a different capacity, thank you for your service and leadership over the years. You now have the luxury of looking back at all the lives that you've positively affected over the years. 
for returning directors. Thank you for serving in what I believe to be the most difficult position in district level work. Long days, high pressure, great demands, competing interests and dwindling resources. No, little to no positive recognition. Need I go on? I think I just saw some new directors exit stage left. <laughs> stage left. And maybe some experienced directors as well. Uh, well, um, so why do we do the work that we do? There we go. So I wanted to thank everyone. I know it was last minute, but I want to thank everyone for the responses that they send in about why they choose to be an educational leader. Hopefully you had a chance to look at those as you were coming in. But to me, it was really fresh, refreshing and inspiring to see why we choose the work that we do. And it's really no surprise we do the work for, for our students. This room is also filled with other professionals and parents vital to the success of students. I'd like to provide a warm welcome to all of the attorneys, parents, advocates, RESC leaders, CERC, professional organization, coaches, and educators. Positive partnerships are essential to the work that we do. Thank you for the support and services, your insight and perspectives on improving special education in Connecticut. So my transition to the Bureau of Special Education has been super. The consultant's knowledge and experience is so impressive. Over the course of the first few months, I've had the opportunity to observe the work that is done. And as the deputy commissioner mentioned, they're truly impressive. Super things are being accomplished. As you know, this is a team that runs itself, literally runs itself. But I'd like to take a moment to introduce the many team members that are here today. I'd first like to ask our administrative support staff to please rise and be recognized. We have Terry Joe, Carol, and Joe Lee here from our office. Thank you for being here today. Regina was unable to be here as well as Lisa, but you do a super job day in and day out. And similar to my district experience, we all know that you run the show. So we wanna thank you personally for making my transition seamless and keeping me out of trouble so far, for the most part. <laughs> uh, our warm, welcoming, and sometimes loud office atmosphere is a place that I look forward to coming to every morning, so thank you. Next, I'd like to ask the educational consultants that work in either performance or student services and organizational effectiveness to please rise. I want to thank Diane, Janet, Deidre, Joe, Laura, Kim, and Scott. Thank you for the work that you do to support our district. You are like superheroes, working tirelessly to assist districts in compliance and data standards that benefit our students. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to ask the consultants from the Bureau of Special Education to please rise. I'm really honored to represent this team that includes Mike, Jim, Jay, Pat, Maria, Gail, Jocelyn, Colleen, and Rhonda. and Mary Jean, who was unable to be here as well. You know what, I'm really not doing the Bureau justice with these introductions. So I think most of you are probably a bit oversaturated with the whole superheroes genre, but I'm sure over the summer you heard about the Wonder Woman movie and Spider-Man, you might have had a chance to see. They were okay, but there's a little known movie that was a smash at the box office. Was not a smash at the box office, excuse me. but. If it's coming to a theater near you, you may want to check it out. Here's a little trailer.
So no consultants were injured in the filming of this video, but we had one very unfortunate incident with a light bulb, but it wasn't too bad. We had cleanup, so. On a serious note, uh, these are our goals for the Bureau of Special Education. This is a responsibility and an honor and a privilege, not a burden, but admittedly a very difficult task, a task that I cannot accomplish on my own, we cannot accomplish as a Bureau. However, working together with your assistance and support, we will and we can realize these goals for our students. As they say, many hands make light work. As I was speaking to people this morning, everyone's coming up and saying, how can I help? How can we get together? Here's some ideas of collaboration. So I'm really looking forward and excited to the work moving forward. And I believe that together we can do great things for our students. For those of you that don't know me, I'd like to share a couple brief notes. I'm a Connecticut native. I went to Catholic school K to eight. I graduated New Britain High School and later UConn as an undergrad and currently living in Storrs, Connecticut. A uh, picture of my family here. I've been married for almost 15 years with three children, two middle school age and one elementary. And this is us outside Wrigley. We're kind of a baseball family, so we, we do the park tour thing in the summertime, except for this summer. <laughs> Here's a, uh, some of the teams that I follow. I'm kind of a sports fanatic, so uh, some of the teams. I also enjoy exercise in the morning before the family wakes up, and New Hampshire, uh, Redwood Forests, and I have an embarrassing collection of baseball memorabilia that I won't speak about too much. Um, in baseball history. So earlier you heard Ellen describe my professional background. I'd just like to emphasize that I'm committed to continuous learning and dedicated to developing my knowledge, skills, and experiences ultimately to benefit our students. As much as I miss my job as a district level special education administrator, I absolutely love being the bureau chief. I will admit though, learning the complex bureaucracy, various departments, staff procedures has been a huge learning curve for me. And I think this clip will sum up my feelings in the first couple months. Last week in Serbian elections, we saw the apparent defeat of President Slobodan Milosevic by challenger Vojislav Kostunica. Yet Milosevic refused to step aside. As president, would you apply pressure on Milosevic and openly aid Kostanica and his Novia Srpskaya party, or by working with neighbors such as Karadan Bragaljevic of Croatia, Istvan Pojonyi of Hungary, or Antipas Legeros of Greece? So. That should instill some confidence in, in me right there, but that's been me in my first few meetings here, learning the, especially general supervision and uh, differentiated monitoring, no. So although I've only been at the Bureau for a few months, I've just about memorized all of our statewide acronyms that are used in education. <laughs> Check. All right, besides acronyms, the most important and exciting part of my job is the fact that I really have a whole new perspective on education. It's truly eye-opening. I'm so thankful to have this new view across the entire state, but with this perspective, I do hold dearly the lessons I learned from district. I'm proud of the accomplishments that I realized in my career as a paraprofessional, teacher, special education teacher, pupil services director, and assistant superintendent. These accomplishments were realized through partnerships and effective communication, systems thinking and leadership, while maintaining a positive perspective. I'll bring these experiences and lessons to my new role while I continue to listen, learn, and grow as a professional. Although this knowledge and experience certainly prepares me for this role, one perspective that I do not have but I'm very sensitive to is being a parent of a child with a disability. I'd like to highlight three lessons learned right now for you from district leadership. The first is the power of partnerships and effective communication. Working with towns, police, unions, and parents, I've learned much can be accomplished when lines of communication are open and 
relationships are grounded in trust. Where transparency prevails and professionals have the opportunity to listen and learn from one another to take action before you take action. Most issues trace to a breakdown in communication in my experience. I'm proud of the fact that as my 12 plus years as a special education administrator, I've had zero due process or complaints filed and only one mediation. Part of that has to do with luck and timing and great staff that I've worked with. Uh, but the, I, I believe the other side of that is the communication that you have with, with the parents within your district. Applying these lessons learned, I've worked to establish partnerships at the state level. Working on seven statewide committees, as well as meeting with stakeholders, I've heard the good, the bad, and unfortunately the ugly in some circumstances when it comes to educating students with disabilities. I'd like to take a moment to share with you some direct quotes from parents that I've met with over my first few months on the job. One parent likened her PPT experience to an alimony hearing and working with the district like dealing with an estranged husband connected to the mafia. <laughs> so it's an actual quote. Another positive quote, our experience has been all good. We've worked with the team at the school and because of that, our child's future is bright. We couldn't ask for more. The special education system is truly wonderful. Next quote. I've been fighting for my child's appropriate education for four years. When I began the battle, battle, I didn't know the laws. I trusted the school district, but boy, was I wrong. When I learned the law and made requests, I was still denied until I spent thousands of dollars to be represented at a meeting. Only then did the district act. I truly believe the district will do as little as possible until you have someone back you. I will never go to a PPT without representation again. Next comment. Support networks are not aligned with our district. They're private groups. The school should provide this collaboration for goodwill and cooperation. Here are some of the pet peeves I heard from parents as well over my time meeting with them. Of course, I'm sure you've heard this, referring to parents as mom and dad at the table of a PPT meeting. The phrase, we don't see that here in school, I'm sorry things are happening at home, but we don't see that here at school. Or everybody, uh, what made me cringe the most as an administrator, we don't do that here in X school. Finally, remind your educators to ease up on the educational jargon. Refer back to the acronym slide. <clears throat> District leaders, I, I know you've heard and received similar feedback, perhaps with even in the same school and with the same team. I know I have with the districts that I've served in. So how do we address this inconsistency in perspective performance? I don't have all the answers, but I know that these relationships should be ground in positive communication, trust, transparency, and professionalism. If we take the time to bridge the gap on these perspectives, the possibilities are endless. I value the parent partnerships that I've developed over the years. They're not perfect and didn't come without conflict. But with a in-district advisory group, we were able to accomplish many things. We gave parents voice not only for their child, but to help other children in the district. And they've came up, they met with school psychologists, principals. We came up with some really concrete and effective things to change things for the better. The environment within the PPT process, walking into meetings with parents rather than being seated at the round the table and have the parent walk in, inclusion-friendly posters, projecting the IEP on the wall rather than talking opposite sides of the table. Those are all ideas that were generated from the parent groups that, that, and within the district and helped us do our jobs better. Next, systems thinking and leadership. So even though I'm a Cowboys fan, I do have to recognize the Patriots organization here for a moment. Uh, they're amazing five Super Bowls and the success over the last 20 years. And despite the criticism, I respect Bill Belichick. This is a coach that has his organization believing that no one person is more important than the team. It's a, system a systems-based approach to winning. He's famously quoted for the overused statement, it is what it is. So I, I know in our line of work, we, have to, we can't sweat the small stuff that we have no control over. The team is never distracted from their goal, which is winning. I wish our goal in education was as simple, but it is not. He also said that our program is built on competition and improving every day. It's not built on excuses. If you give people excuses, they will take them. 
there are a zillion excuses that we all have this morning, and we shouldn't use any of them. We can't afford to use excuses when our students' education's at stake. In Plainfield, we never said we were the 10th poorest community. We never said that we were 50% reduced, free and reduced lunch. We never said, oh, this parent's not involved, so there's nothing we can do. Those are all excuses. You try to pers persevere and do what's right for kids, and together you can accomplish great things. Over the years, as Ellen mentioned, there's been a significant reduction in staff at the state. However, it's not okay to say we are unable to defend student rights or provide leadership because we don't have the staff to do that. So like you, we at the State Department are reprioritizing and looking at doing our work differently, effectively and efficiently to accomplish these goals. I'm excited and encouraged by the partnerships and the early discussions that I've had with CONCASE leadership, CERC, RESCs, educational consultants, and support agencies like CAS to align our leadership and professional learning initiatives to provide targeted support. We have a wonderful leadership conference and series coming up in March, which you'll hear more about and it's posted for the legal conference. We can no longer operate in silos or duplicative efforts. One simple measure that we've taken is we asked each of you to fill out a survey to let us know what level of experience you have within your district. We're gonna to try to target the professional development and learning based on that. So I want to thank the data office and all those involved with the survey for that very valuable information and thank you for your time. Let's learn from each other and create structure, structures to provide productive formats for the flow of information. I can't tell you how valuable it was for me at EastCon in the quiet corner to be part of those listservs and just ask questions to each other to our colleagues. Here's the situation, how would you handle this? You get back four or five responses, maybe put one response to the side that Brian sent and work on something different. But it's so great to hear those different perspectives and I do appreciate that. So I believe we need more of those types of venues to be able to share information. I'm also encouraged that we're reaching out to a broader target audience. Principals, general education administrators, PPT chairs, not to pat yourselves on the back, but you can only be in so many places at once. So your staff needs to have the same level of expertise and knowledge that you do when PPT meetings are happening or requests are being made for special education students. Your leadership is needed in so many areas. And since I don't have the time to discuss all aspects of special education, I've attempted to highlight just three that come to mind. Leadership is needed with the IEP document, a user-friendly document. Imagine if we can shout that statement with pride. The document is a foundation to the student's learning plan. Do we treat it as such? To what extent are our students involved? How are they developed? Are present levels of performance accurate? Are goals measurable? These are the meat and potatoes, the information that really matters within the document. Let's get back to the basics and work together to improve the form, the substance, and the usability of this document. Two, a shift from learning, to, from helping to learning. In my experience, there is a really highly overused reliance on adult assistance right now in, spe in special education. <laughs> Educators take care to ensure that we are not inadvertently enabling our students less help and more instruction and skill development. These requests are coming from parents and educators alike. We need now more than ever to prepare independent learners that are career ready. Keep expectations high and rigor high and reliance on adult assistance low. I'd like to share a clip from a movie. Where's my? here. <laughs> I'd like to share a clip from a movie uh, <laughs> that depicts a young Ray Charles, now blind, asking to help for help and the lengths that his mother went to foster independence in her son.
I hear you too, Mama. You're right there. <laughs> yes, I am. Why are you crying, Mama? Because I'm happy. So pretty, pretty powerful scene, but how many of us would have run up to that young Ray Charles and helped him up initially? And imagine how much his life would have been different if the mother hadn't taken that stance. So when I see this clip, I think about schools and relate that to some of the support that we're providing to students with special needs. The final area is supporting complex needs. So as you know, more and more students are coming to school unable to learn, under the influence, disengaged, unmotivated, unable to adapt to environments, exposed to trauma, abuse, neglect, and unable to learn because their basic needs are not met. As special education leaders, what role do we play with this population? I had an interesting conversation with attorney Feinstein about this population. Do they feel safe in school? Are schools safe places? Are educators prepared to support this population? You shared a story about a, a student named Speedo Green, Ryan Speedo Green, who's now performing at the Ensemble of Vienna State Opera. The path in which this goal was realized for this student is written in a novel called Sing for Your Life. Speedo Green grew up in a trailer with bullet holes along the side, was abused, kicked out of school after school, and spent time in the juvenile detention system. Until one day, a dynamic teacher, we, we all know the story, one teacher makes a difference, made a breakthrough. After he threw a chair across the room in the classroom, the teacher told him to sit on the floor because she was teaching. And he asked, why didn't you kick me out? Why didn't you send me to the principal's office? Aren't you gonna send me out? And the teacher said, you are my student. That same teacher helped him discover his voice. In the OSEP Leadership Conference this year in DC, I had the opportunity to hear from Dr. Rosemary Allen, who's an amazing researcher and eloquent speaker on discussing implicit bias. She shared staggering figures of the number of students that are kicked out of schools around the country. We need to be careful about the message that we are inadvertently sending in these situations. Some children are disposable. Some children can stay in the classroom, others cannot. Others have to go. Across the state, we have to change our focus from responding to behaviors to addressing the reasons for the behaviors and getting the students the help they need, the right help. And schools cannot do this alone. We've not learned completely how to successfully support many of this, these types of students within our districts. 
to create culturally responsive environments that are safe, secure. This is a needy and vulnerable population and one that needs us the most. So let's follow in the footsteps of Speedo Green's teacher and develop positive relationships and help these students find their voice. The last area I'd like to speak about is celebrating the positive. In my new role, I will strive to celebrate the wonderful things that are happening for students across the state. We need to highlight great leaders, programs, districts, teachers, paraprofessionals, and activities that are happening. Oh, and most importantly, our students' voice. Students like Speedo Green and the program at UConn called the UConn Le Youth Leadership Forum. In my first few months, I had the opportunity to go to a luncheon, and I heard from 40 plus students with disabilities that spent four days at the UConn campus. It was truly inspiring. They talked about the friendships that they were made. One student said for the first time in his life, he was proud to have a disability. Another was astounded at what could be accomplished in working together as a team. Others shared that disability no longer defined them. Truly inspirational. These stories need to be told. These types of programs that are difficult to measure in numbers, their success and impact may only be realized by hearing from the students and witnessing them in person. I believe that successful special education programs are so much more than the numbers and defining gaps and deficits. So let's continue to highlight students' strengths, assist them in developing positive relationships, and provide opportunities for positive experiences. Let's maintain a balance between the academics and the arts, unified sports, unified theater, programs that are so important in building community and independence. Please share with us your district's accomplishments. Invite us out to witness positive programs and things that are happening within your communities. I'd love to communicate this in my travels over, over the course of the year. In summary, I'd like to continue to build and fortify that bridge between the parent point of view and the educator point of view. Advocate with, not for, students. Take care to ensure that we are not inadvertently enabling our students. Keeping expectations and rigor high and reliance on adult assistance low. And remember every day why we do what we do. It is for the students. We come to work every day. To our students, from you I receive inspiration. When I was in DC, as I mentioned, Dr. Rosemary Allen shared a quote that you may be familiar with us from James Baldwin. For these are all our children. We will all profit by or pay for what they become. Keep this in mind as you prepare for your school year. Keep this in mind as those 603 forms fly across your desks. Keep this in mind as you see a student's face light up when they finally understand a difficult concept or have accomplished something within your district. Let's never stop working, searching, and listening for student voice in special education. Work to understand it, cultivate it. We hear frequently from educators, legislators, parents, current attorneys. Let's not forget the most important voice of all, student voice. I have a short video to share with you, and I will not close out of this one. <laughs> Two-time learning. Gold star. This is the uh, Unified Theater Program performed at Woodstock Academy.
was awesome. Much better in person, I'm sure, but pretty inspiring. So let's work through the distractions. Let's continue to have our students inspire us. I want to thank you once again. I wish you all a happy, healthy, and productive school year, and I'm very excited to help support the work that's done all across the state. Thank you. Wow. Thank you again, Brian, for your passion, your knowledge, and your leadership as you guide us in doing our work every day on behalf of all students and their families, helping educators and helping leaders do what we, do what we need to do best. It gives me great pleasure as one of the CERC consultants, we have truly the great opportunity to partner with the State Department of Education, the Bureau of Special Education, Academic Office, Performance Office, to really support the work of the State Department of Ed. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce some of the superheroes that are here to present to you. One of those superheroes is Gail Mangs, who leads the due process unit. She'd like to give you some updates. Thank you. And I'm not gonna start by mentioning all the copyright laws that Brian just violated. <laughs> That'll just be our little secret today. Um, so it, it's been a, an unusual year in the due process unit, as probably you are all aware. And I wanna start, first of all, by just giving you some statistics so you know what we've been doing and what you all have been doing. And not to pick on Brian again, but this is probably a bit of a shock for him. For someone who went 12 years with one mediation, um, our numbers are Connecticut numbers. What can I say? So this year, and I'm talking about the 16-17 school year, we had 175 complaints filed. And actually, that's down from last year when we had 186 complaints filed. Of the complaints that were filed this year, 43 had corrective action that might grow a little because there's still 14 active complaints. Hearings were up this year, hearing requests. We had 271 hearing requests this year as compared to last year, 247, um, which is kind of a significant increase for which I have no explanation whatsoever. Um, of those so far, seven went to a fully adjudicated uh, decision this year. Mediations, we had 329 um, requests for mediation, which is down from last year. Again, I have no explanation. Last year, we had 371 requests for mediation. Um, and even though they're down this year, um, for those of us who were out there mediating, we could not tell the difference and neither can my car. Um, and as usual, from year to year, we always average about 65% of the mediations resolve on the day of mediation. And then most of them go one way or the other thereafter, but as you know, very few actually go on to a fully adjudicated hearing. Um, I also wanted to share with you some of the major issues. Um, we have a database where we keep all the statistics um, for mediations, hearings, and complaints. So this is a little bit subjective because we enter um, the issues ourselves after looking at the agreements or um, the reports from the mediators and the hearing officers. Um, this year, as in most years, um, the issue is private day placement. So this year, 168 of mostly hearings and mediations, I would say. Um, we don't usually get complaints around those kinds of outplacements. But 168 of the due process entries involved a private day placement. Um, and that compares to last year, actually, 216 of them um, were private day placements. 
The next largest was residential placements. And this year, 99 of the hearings and mediations involved requests for a residential placement. Last year, that was 85. Um, the next largest category is IEEs. Surprise, right? Independent uh, educational evaluations. This year, 75 of the hearings and mediations involved IEE requests. Last year, 76, so pretty consistent. Um, after that, child find was a big issue. We had 47 of the due process hearings and mediations involved child finds. Last year, that was 41. Transition, um, and that's kind of a growing category for us in terms of mediations and hearings. Um, 30 involved transition issues. And last was eligibility issues. 23 this year involved eligibility. So as you can see, we've been really busy. And I just want to point out that I always say we. Um, but every time a complaint, a hearing, or a mediation has come into our office, when I say we, I really mean Carol. Um, <laughs> because Carol is the person in the office who handles all of the notices that go out, every single one of these. So when we got to, um, I think we hit 609 entries into the database for this past school year, that means Carol was involved in every single one of those. So I just wanna give Carol some applause. So as you know, we have embarked on a new mediation system. And some of you are, um, have probably met some of the new mediators. Uh, this was directed by OSEP that we would contract out with impartial mediators. And that puts us in line with just about every other state. We are, are truly um, one of the last states to have had mediators who were employees of the Department of Education, Bureau of Special Education. And we all, we enjoyed it, and I think the in-house mediators are going to miss it, though their cars will not, again. Um, first, I'd like to introduce the mediators to you. They're not all here today, but of, of the ones that are here, if you guys can just kind of stand up when I read your name. And they all have either mediation or special education experience. Um, they've all been out there. We're having a meeting this afternoon. So they've been out there with us, um, observing us. Then we went out with them, observing them. And now they're out there on their own. And I know there's gonna be some war stories to share this afternoon. Um, so let me just introduce you. Patricia Ober, you can just stand up. And while Pat is definitely um, deserving of individual applause, why don't you just wait till I introduce them all? Uh, Christine Barrington, Joe Boyle, Karen Dambois, Kirsten Dovenberg, Cynthia Gilcrest, Michael Kaczynski, Howard Klebanoff, Ann Paul, and Dana Simone. Um, a couple of them were not able to be here today, but. We're excited about all of them, and we've tried to introduce them to mediation slowly. They know there can be really long days. I've assured them all that the latest I ever stayed at a mediation was 8 o'clock. So you, you know you'll be home by 9 anyway. Um, the new system of assigning mediators now is very similar to what we've done with our hearing officers. A new mediation request comes into our office, and we're keeping the mediators on an alphabetical list. The next available mediator will be assigned to the mediation unless they have some personal conflict with the, the school district involved. You will receive an email from Carol um, identifying the mediator and giving you contact information. And the mediator will contact the parties um, mostly by email unless somebody doesn't have email um, to schedule the mediation. Uh, there's no need to provide a date. I mean, you can, but we're pretty much going to ignore it. 
um, and you will work with the mediator to find a date on which everybody can agree on. Um, the mediator will contact us with the agreed upon date, and I hate to say this again, Carol will send out the notice. Um, that might eventually change. And it will include an evaluation form for you to fill out so we can see how the system is working and make adjustments as needed and provide professional development where it's needed. Um, we think this is gonna be easier for everybody involved, especially for Carol. Not, I'm not picking on you, really. Um, so, you know, try your best. I think it's gonna be great. I feel very good about our new mediators. Um, certainly feel free to call the due process unit with any questions, any concerns. Um, it's very important to us that, that this go forward successfully. And as some, as you, some of you probably know, we also have new hearing officers. Um, our, our hearing officer pool has thinned out pretty much the way the Bureau of Special Education has thinned out. Um, and we contracted with, with new hearing officers, so we actually have 14 hearing officers now. Um, some of them are here today, and I, I want to introduce them. And I will include the, I was going to say old, the seasoned hearing officers. Um, and you can stand up as you hear your names. We have Ann Bird, um, Susan Dixon, Brett Fitton, Gregory Goodstein, uh -huh. Sylvia Ho, Janice German, I don't think she's here today, Patrick Kennedy, Uswa Khan, Kelly Moyer, Melinda Powell, Ray Regat, Justino Rosado, Laura Scher, and Jane Ford Shaw. Thank you. And they are all attorneys and they all have either special education experience or administrative law experience. Um, they've all been out to observe hearings and you will hopefully not see them soon in your district. Um, and we're excited to have them here too. Last thing, and, and hopefully this will catch us up on the time, I've been asked to just um, mention one piece of new legislation around restraint and seclusion. And if you have any questions about this, the person to ask is Colleen Hales. Um, but I know there was a lot of concern about the training of school district personnel regarding restraint and seclusion. And this year, um, legislation was passed to kind of ease that burden on the school district. So for the school year, and I'm gonna read this so I make sure that I get it right. For the school year beginning July 1st, that's already started, 2017, you probably know that each Board of Education is required um, to identify in each school in the district a crisis intervention team that would consist of any teacher, administrator, school, paraprofessional, or other school employee designated by the principal and who has direct contact with students to respond to any incident in which restraint or seclusion may be necessary as an emergency intervention. Each local or regional board of ed shall provide training regarding restraint and seclusion to the members of the crisis intervention teams for each school in the district. And each member must be recertified in the use of restraint and seclusion on an annual basis. However, the change is now each regional or local board of ed may provide this training to any teacher, administrator, school prayer, paraprofessional, or other school employee designated by the school principal. So it's no longer mandatory to train everybody in the building. We're restricting this now to the crisis intervention team. And if you need any further um, information, follow up, you can call me or, or Colleen Hales. Thank you and enjoy the morning. It gives me great pleasure to introduce another superhero, Thomas Boudreau from the department, who is the IDEA grants, the fund manager. That's IDEA correct. grants, got it. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
How are things? I'm Tom Boudreau. I'm the IDEA fiscal um, manager for um, the Bureau of Special Education. And I've spoken with many of you, but there's probably some new faces out there. So I want to give the Reader's Digest version of the IDEA grant real quickly so that we could um, move forward. And at the end of this, just comment briefly about a new tool, an Excel spreadsheet, that's going to be required for next year's FY19 application. The, there we go. Um, IDA Part B is broken into two sections. Section 611 is for 3 to 21 year olds, and Section 619 is for 3 to 5 year olds. The LEA applies annually, it's an annual grant of a two year cycle. So we're in fiscal year 18. Now sometimes people are confused in relationship to how to know which fiscal year we're part of. So if you say out the entire two year cycle, if you say the annual year twice, that's the fiscal year you're part of. So 7117 is 63018 is the first year. The second carryover year is 7118 to 63019. So by saying 18 twice lets you determine that you're in the fiscal year 18. Although it's two years, we don't want you to spend the money broken up into 50-50. We want it to be 85% of the funds in the first year, and then the carryover year is approximately 15% is what we're looking for. And then when you apply for the grant, in that application process, we're examining eligibility, we're ensuring that the district is demonstrating compliance, and that there's agreement around monitoring for the management of risk for the grant around uniform grant guidance. Some other elements to be aware of is that IDA funds cannot be used for child find activities. It's only to be used for the excess cost associated with the provision of special education. And people get confused because they, the word excess cost, this has nothing to do with the excess cost grant for the state of Connecticut, although it's a similar term. Under the IDEA grant, you're establishing a threshold by which that you need to meet, and then you can access the funds after that threshold is met. It's understood it's in tandem as you're doing this, but the threshold is the excess cost element that we're talking about there. You have a separate accounting system in place. You need to be able to demonstrate that their expenditures are a bright line so that if you have the 619 numbers and you're working for someone for a three to five year old, make sure there's a bright line for that line item and that you're meeting all the requirements for IDEA. So some of the updates in relationship to FY17. I sent out a memo back in August and I'm still getting calls for this. So if you're not on my list and not getting the memos, let me know. And as well, read the memos, they're important. Because in this it talked about that for 611 in the carryover year, second part, there was actually an increase in all of the state. Now a lot of business managers, their ED111 and ED141 forms that they fill out, they're using the old ones, it hasn't been updated where your ED114, your budget in the prepayment grant system, has been updated. So that's the correct number. So if your business manager's having trouble reconciling that, redirect them to my memo, get them to the ED114, or have them contact me. Um, there was no change to 619, and therefore any final budget revisions that you're gonna be doing for the grant will be due approximately February 1st of next year. In relationship to FY18, that was just posted, and approximately 54% of the LAAs had an increase in this year's grant compared to last. And when I talk about funding and these pieces, understand it's a federal formula that the numbers are broken down from. The Bureau of Grants Management takes the money, and then it's established by you have a base rate, and then it's impacted by both your school census and poverty. So that's where those changes happen. For 619, there was a decrease across the street. This has been somewhat level funded all along. And then uh, for a date to be aware of for FY18 is next July 1st. Those of you who have set aside for coordinated early intervening services, CEIS, be it you're doing it voluntarily or you're mandated to do so, 
or say you have your non-publics and you have your meaningful annual uh, consultation with them, that's money that you've set aside that needs to be spent in this year. So it's not carrying over because that's the commitment you've made to that non-public and that's also the elements by which that are part of the plan that you've submitted around your CEIS. And then for FY19, we have a new um, uh, Excel spreadsheet that's going to be utilized. Um, and several sections of this are going to be part of the application process for next year. I'll get over that, go, go into that in a second. But the real key, and we know for the purpose of IDEA, and we just talked about it, is to assist with the excess costs of providing special education and related services for students with disabilities. The issue that I want to point out here is the assist part. Because within IDEA, it also talks about that IDEA funds must be used to supplement state, local, and other federal funds and not supplant those funds. The real key to this that we look at is around an element called maintenance of effort. And I'll read it to you of where a local maintenance of effort, MOE, the requirement obligates any LEA receiving IDEA Part B funds to budget, which is one part, and spend at least the same amount of local or state and local funds for the education of children with disabilities on a year-to-year -year basis. MOE, in the last two years in the application, I've been introducing some of this language so everybody will be aware of it around the budgetary side and the compliance side. So let's just quickly bounce into that. Understand that eligibility for IDA funding is based on the LEA's demonstration of MOE. Supplanting occurs when the LEA doesn't have the proposed budget is less than the educational expenditures the previous year. So for next year's grant, your proposed budget is actually looked at compared to expenditures of 16-17. Why? Because if you're not budgeting to spend the same if not more, you're probably not going to spend the same, if not more. And so that's the eligibility side that looks at that comparison. The compliance side is actually, what did you do? Where are you with your expenditures comparatively? So we'll be looking at the 16-17 compared to the 15-16 expenditures. If there's a shortfall in relationship to that, there are allowable exceptions and adjustments that can be applied, but understand the consequence for failure to maintain effort includes a recovery action using non-federal dollars that needs to be returned to OSEP. So there are four methods that you can use. You can compare local to local. You can compare state and local expenditures and per capita of local and per capita of state to state. All of these, well, and one thing to note is that in relationship to that is that you can use different methods for the eligibility side and for the compliance side. They don't have to be the same, and all you do is have to meet it in one category. How can we help you in relationship to this? We've introduced an MOE calculator. It's a spreadsheet that has it broken down in relationship to all the different methods that are available to you and that are going to be going out to the 1920 year. It's available on the website. I recommend that you download it and look at it. If you have experience with um, Excel, there's a, like a instructions at a glance, a one pager, but in the tool itself, there's an, extru an instruction bulletin under tab one. But often, when we go into a new tool or new instructions or even with Excel in general, sometimes it feels like a treasure map. Where am I? What am I doing? And so what I'm going to be giving is a webinar in October that's going to be talking about this tool itself, where to fill it in, how to fill it in, and what parts are going to be needed for next year's application. Okay? I encourage you to take a look at that. I encourage you to attend this, communicate with your team of who should be there. It's going to be an interactive process, and we'll be kind of rolling this out through the year so that next year the application will go seamless. Thanks so much. Any questions, contact me. So our next session we have...
special education data updates. Fresh off the data conference yesterday, right in this very hotel. I'd like to introduce Diane Murphy from the performance office. We have some important data information to share. Thank you very much. Diane. Thank you. No, I'll put it down. I'll just use the arrow. Okay. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Uh, we started all of our back to school stuff yesterday with the performance office summit and we had a really great discussion so I was really excited this morning to wake up and be here because I missed you guys. Let me start with just a very quick summary of the audit. Um, all the districts passed for the first time in all the years of the audit. <laughs> Trust me, it lessened my work too, so thank you very much. Um, there were a few consistent problems that I would like to remind everyone of. Uh, we did have the most transition recodes this year of students from, ha from being reported to the department as having transition in place to upon audit of the IEP transition was not in place. The most recodes ever. Um, so I would in a minute, I'm going to remind you of a few of the requirements to say yes in CDAC for whether or not a student has transition in place. We also seem to have a miscommunication about page one enrolled grade and enrolled grade next year. Connecticut state law requires students to be enrolled in an age appropriate grade, so you cannot tell me on page one that enrolled grade is ungraded, okay? Ungraded is an accommodation that you talk about over on whatever that page is in the IEP that I never look at. Page one is about what grade they're enrolled in. So if they are a 20 year old in your transition only program, they are a grade 12 student according to Connecticut. Additionally, school next year must be filled out. Transition rules, I need two page sevens. One with a post-secondary education training goal and one with an employment goal. They must be separate. You can't check both boxes. You can't combine them. If they're the same goal, which I believe there is a way to write it so they are the same goal, you still need two pages. One for post-secondary ed and one for employment. You also must tell me about transition assessments. Way too many districts gave me student IEPs where the transition assessments were blank. You all were doing them because you talked about them on page two but you didn't fill in the required data element on page six, so please take a look at that. Course of study, that question number six, we talk about whether or not the student is enrolled in an academic program or enrolled in transition only. Uh, we have some new rules right now, transition only starting this school year can only be marked for students who are 12th graders. So if you come back and tell me that a ninth grade student has completed all of their academic requirements for graduation and is doing transition only, I'm going to send the IEP back to you. Um, you can't do that. Uh, we did institute some new PSIS uh, edits in order to address this issue. So you will find your PSIS people getting upset with you. If you have children that are in grades 9, 10, and 11 that you are reporting with facility code 1 as a transition only location. So please pause and take a look with your transition kids about where you have the transition being reported through PSIS. If they are grade 9, 10, and 11, facility code 1 in PSIS should be the academic location. For 12th graders, they may have facility code one being their transition location. We also have um, something that's been coming up the last two years um, and got kind of big this year uh, with regard to settlement agreements. Um, there is some guidance about settlement agreements that is pretty clear in the CDAC appendix. I've put it here for you. Um, but I ask that you pause and take a look at that. What's happening is, and this is coming up through assessment, so you're picking up the phone and you're calling Joe or Janet and saying, 
Um, I can't assess Diane. And we're saying, why can't you? Well, Diane was never reported in PSIS. And, and you, so someone didn't report me in PSIS because they think I'm on a settlement agreement, but you're implementing an IEP, so technically it's not a settlement agreement. You may have mediated and came to a decision, but if you're implementing that IEP and you, as the director, are thinking I need to be testing Diane, they have to be reported in PSIS. We also are having you call us to say, I shouldn't be assessing Diane. Why is she on my list in the AIR reporting system as someone who needs to be tested? Diane is a settlement agreement. That means that you did report me in PSIS when you shouldn't have because you're not implementing an IEP, you're just writing the check. So we have to pause and think about who are settlement agreement kids and who are not because it has been causing some issues with the testing. So here's a summary of how the rules work. If you have questions about that, um, you can call Laura Guerrera. <laughs> okay. So for two years, I've been coming up here and talking to you about disproportionality. Well, I mean, really, I've been doing it since the first day they hired me, like 17 years ago. But um, in the last two years, I've been reminding you that the federal government was going to change their rules about how we assess and calculate disproportionate representation and over-representation in special education. If you recall, probably a year ago, I even sent an email out begging all the directors to comment on the federal regulation. The new rules are now here, and they are in place. So I want to let you know what the impact will be. So new federal regulations to determine significant disproportionality based upon race and ethnicity. This timeline means that we must be in compliance and implementing the redirection of funds by July 1 of 2018, which means because we use historic data, it's happening now. Nothing about who we are assessing for disproportionate representation is changing. Uh, we're still doing identification, we're still doing placement, we're still doing discipline, however, Starting in 2020, we must no longer assess disproportionate representation for three to 21 year olds. We must include three, four, and five year olds in that analysis. Now, all of you can probably imagine what including three, four, and five year olds is going to do because what we do in this calculation is we compare students with disabilities to your district-wide enrollment. Since your pre-K tends to be 50-50, you're going to see an impact of including three, four, and five-year-olds when we move to this in 2020, because we have no way to create a denominator right now for the three, four, and five-year-olds who are not sitting in your building since we do not have universal pre-K. Um, I know that it will be my mission for the next couple of years to write many, many, many people at the federal level trying to get this piece of the legislation changed. I would ask that you help me with that before July 1 of 2020 occurs. The methodology is still a risk ratio, so Connecticut is in good shape on that. That methodology has not changed. We are doing the, comparing the uh, risk for students with disabilities by race to the risk for all other children to be a student with disabilities. There are some new um, ideas within this. The formula isn't any different. It's the number of kids from a racial and ethnic group within a disability category divided by the enrolled number of students in your district within that race category. So the number of black ID kids divided by the number of black students in your district, all students. Um, then you're comparing that to the number of all other children. So all the other Students with disabilities with all the other categories not in ID divided by all the other race category students not ID. Sorry, ID. Who are ID? So there's a rule about minimum, in, minimum cell size, and that is the top number. How many students with disabilities who are black ID do I have to have before I calculate this? That's minimum in size, minimum cell size. <laughs> Minimum in size is the denominator. 
how many comparison students must I have in order to calculate this? And if you recall, when we compare, in some districts, when I compare the number of um, white autism students on the top to the number of autism students of all other races on the bottom, this becomes a concern for us because in some of your districts you don't have very many and that really has an impact on how that ratio works out. So there's a minimum in size to address that ratio. We've never had minimum cell and minimum in sizes in Connecticut. It hasn't been a problem. Um, the reason that it hasn't been a problem is because when we got our formula approved, however many years ago that was that we got our, our formula approved, Connecticut wrote in the use of a confidence interval. Now, if you're a statistician, you're saying to me, why do you have a confidence interval, Diane? You only use confidence intervals when you work with samples, and we don't have samples. These are population data. Yeah, sh the feds didn't really understand that, so I worked in a confidence interval and they approved it. Only now, somebody caught on, and we're not allowed to have a confidence interval anymore. So they're saying in, in the discussions with us, okay, we're not letting you have a confidence interval, but we'll let you have a minimum in size and a minimum cell size. It's not as good as a confidence interval. So what happens if you don't meet the minimum in size, so you don't have enough comparison students in that group who are not of that race, of the comparison race, is that now instead of me saying, oh, we're not gonna look at you, we now must compare that group to the state level data. So it's no longer, I don't meet the denominator, I'm done. It's now, I don't meet the no denominator in my district level data, the denominator becomes the state level data. So the state ratio is what you become compared to. That is called the alternate risk ratio, and it is required in federal statute. They did allow us to keep the concept of consecutive years. If you recall, our previous formula allowed two years. They are going to allow up to three years that a district would have to have disproportionate representation for three years in a row before we have a conversation about redirect. So the state of Connecticut will be recommending to our stakeholder group to move from two years to three years. They also have a new provision called reasonable progress, which allows us to say, yes, you have three years of data where your risk ratios are um, above whatever the threshold is, but you're going in the correct direction You've been doing work to improve appropriate identification in that area, and your risk ratios are going down each year. Um, we will have to be working with our stakeholder group to establish our definition of reasonable progress for Connecticut. This is a new piece that's good. We haven't had a reasonable progress rule in the past, so this is at least one other place that the, the federal government has put in a provision that, that is helpful. So we will have stakeholder input. Um, at a minimum, we'll be using the state advisory panel. I, we haven't formulated this group, so I'm not sure if we'll be expanding that at all. But there are four pieces of information that Connecticut does have control over. The reasonable threshold, are we looking at, we've in the past, if you recall, done two years at 4.0 RRI or above. So the 4.0 RRI is the th reasonable threshold. What are we using? The, the minimum cell size, the minimum in size, and the reasonable progress are the four things that we have control over in the new required formula. I, I have some really strong ideas and opinions about the top three <laughs> um, statistically, but the bottom one is um, wide open for some conversation at this point. So, what happens if we identify you for disproportionate representation, significant disproportionality? Um, the same things that were happening before. Uh, before we called it CEIS, now it's called CCEIS. Helpful. It's now Comprehensive Coordinated intervention, Early Intervening Services. Um, so you're still doing CCEIS, you're still reviewing your policies, practices, and procedures, and you're still, if you make changes to your policies, practices, and procedures, publicly reporting on that. 
The one big change that did happen under the CEIS, the comprehensive CEIS, is this piece, which in theory is in yellow. I can't tell if it's in yellow from there. But um, in the past, the CEIS rule was that you had to use the 15% redirect on students who were not students with disabilities, but who were students within the racial group where the disproportionate identification was identified. You may now use the CEIS dollars for students with disabilities, but not exclusively for them. So that's a pretty major change on what the 15% redirect means for you. So that's another positive piece of the federal legislation. So just to review, we are recommending to our stakeholder group that we haven't put together yet, reducing our RRI from 4.0 to 3.0. Um, that's because the federal legislation says they won't approve anything above a 3.0. We are required by law to remove the confidence interval from the formula. We will be making recommendations of a minimum cell size and a minimum end size. And we will be applying the new alternate risk ratio to compare to state figures when the comparison group in district is too small. What this means for you. Simply by taking our previous formula and moving to a 3.0 RRI, we have approximately 10 districts above a 3.0. That's using the old formula with a confidence interval. So 16, 17, we've already told you who you are. Um, the information that, that we have told you about is at a 4.0. We will definitely let you know who you are if you're at a 3.0. We will continue to direct using the 4.0 and the two years for 1617. Everyone under redirect has already been informed of that. Starting with the 1718 data, then I know you've already held every PPT and you're about to upload to me. We are moving to a 3.0 relative risk index, no confidence interval, and applying the minimum N and minimum cell and alternate risk ratio rules. The redirect for 1718 will be off of two years of old data and one year of the new formula. What I need you to understand is that under the old formula, 3.0 means about 10 districts. Under the new formula with the alternate risk ratio, that means approximately 60 districts will be identified with a minimum of one area, if not more areas, in which they have significant disproportionality. So we're moving to a conversation about a third of you needing to talk about 15% redirect. Now granted, in 1617, we're not looking at a third of you doing redirect because we're still using two years of old data, which means we're talking about the four districts in 1516, the 10 districts in 1617, and the 60 in 1718, you have to be in all three. So if you are a redirect for 1617 and you were a redirect for 1516, you know who you are. We're probably going to have some conversations about 1718 data. In 1819, we will use one year of old data, the 1617 data, and two years under the new formula. Technically, what we are choosing to do in 1819 is not in compliance with the federal law. But we're making a stance that the state of Connecticut is not going to go back and recalculate 1718. We're going to use the data we've already shared publicly um, and moving forward. So that will be the year where we have those 10 districts from 1617 and 60 districts in 1718 and 60 districts in 1819. And in 1920 will be the first year you can expect that we're having conversations with approximately 60 districts statewide about a redirect due to disproportionate representation. Okay, sorry. So moving on to other lovely news. How am I doing for time? Oh, I'm going much faster, he said. 
Uh, okay, so yesterday we um, had an amazing conversation. I know not all of you were able to be in the room. There were a number of directors um, and other administrators for special ed in the room, and it was a great conversation. We were talking about what's happening with special ed data population information. Um, just so you know, uh, in the history of IDA in the state of Connecticut, um, until the 14-15 school year, we had never been above a 13% K-12 prevalence rate. We're now in our third year above 13.0, uh, and probably the trajectory means we're looking at 14 for this school year. Uh, just so you know, there's two things that are impacting that number. Obviously, the count of K-12 special ed students is on the rise. If you look at 2007-8, we had approximately 64,000. Now we're up to 72,000, so we've jumped 8,000 kids in that number of years. We also have the impact of our total K-12 population in the state of Connecticut dropping. It's not dropping at nearly as significant a rate as our increase in the special ed population but it is having an impact on how quickly that prevalence number, K-12 prevalence number, is rising. This is the rate of change, which is what I'm referring to. Um, you can see that we're dropping somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.75% a year in our overall state population, but we are increasing at a rate of 25 to 3.5% a year in special ed. There are multiple places that that's happening. Our preschool prevalence data are remaining pretty um, stable, but we are seeing jumps in our K3 prevalence data, in our 4-8 prevalence data, in our 9-12 prevalence data, and we absolutely saw a very large leap in the number of students in the 16-17 school year whom are students that are in the 18 to 21 year old doing transition only activities. All of those things are contributing. If you look, you know, it's 1.8%, 2%, 2.5%. They're all contributing fairly equally. So this isn't like something I can say, let's really look at what's happening in high school. It's not going to work that way. It's happening across the board, across all the districts. We did look at it by district. I, and there are a few districts who had higher jumps in the last year and two years. Although when we look at it by Derg, it's, this is not a regional issue. This is not a fiscal issue. It's happening across all of the districts. One of the places that we are seeing a great deal of change is through the three to five year old population. So I said preschool was remaining fairly stable, but when you look at it from three to five, which is the way that your 619 funds are rolling out, three to five has seen large increases in the last three years. Our rate of change since 2008 for special ed overall is 12.8%. The numbers on the bottom for students with disabilities change are the rate of change from one year to the next. So when you see that under 2009-10, the change from 08 to 09 was a negative 0.3%. As you see, starting in 12-13, um, we're seeing that rise occur. Here are the primary disability areas where we are going up. The rate of change over the last several years for the LD population is 17% increases. OHI is 33% increases, and autism is 83.6% increases. We, again, had a fabulous discussion yesterday about a lot of things that the department needs to be doing to help support you, about a lot of things we can do data-wise to help support you. Um, it, I really feel like we got some, some positive direction of where we can go to help address these increases. We do have some areas where we're going down. Um, ID has dropped 3%, ED has dropped 2.5%, and speech language impairment has dropped over 25% in the last several years. One of the things we will be doing is looking at how students are changing. We're gonna, we're gonna propose a longitudinal study to look at how um, primary disability identification is changing for kids to see if this is about, I'm so sorry, Michael, to see if this is about the, the disability type or if it's our students being funneled into other areas instead of into speech, instead of into ID, what's happening? And I'm done. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Now I'd like to introduce another superhero from the Bureau, Patricia Anderson, who's gonna give you an overview of 
SLD dyslexia. Yeah. Good morning. It's on. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to tag on some of the data that Diane just presented. Um, we had three years of d dyslexia legislation starting with January 1st, 2014 was the first year that we had legislation. Um, we've had uh, only two years of full data collection, so 15, 16, and 16, 17. In the dark purple, you know purple is my favorite color. In the dark purple, you can see uh, the 15, 16 data. We had a 55% increase over the two years of students with SLD dyslexia. Students identified for the first time was a 50% increase going from 231 to 347. And students who were previously identified with another disability the year before being identified as having dyslexia was a 63% increase. So this is kind of telling you how this legislation has been impacting our numbers. The percentages of students identified for the first time and previously identified have pretty much stayed about the same over the two years that we had, or roughly around 30%, 70%. And the percentage of students with SLD in a population of students with disabilities and the percentage of students with SLD, sorry, with dyslexia um, in students with learning disabilities, again, has stayed about the same um, over the two years. We were at about 3% um, the first year and have gone up to 5% roughly in the 16-17 uh, school year. So I thought it was interesting to take a look at some of the previous identifications of students who are now SLD dyslexia and this kind of bears out the data that Diane was, was saying. Um, we had um, students who were SLD before that are now SLD dyslexia, was one of the largest groups, also speech and language impairment, and OHI ADHD was the other disability category that were the top three largest categories from the previous uh, year's identification. So I want to just talk briefly about the legislation because I think many of you have been doing a great job. It was um, thrust upon us in 2014. We've had two years of giving you lots of professional development. I'm going to highlight some of the things that are coming up for this year. Um, I'm not going to go into this piece of legislation, which is the most recent one, which Ellen talked about this morning. But just to say that we have been working on in-service education, professional learning, that was originally taken out of the legislation in this past session and was put back in. So that is still there. You're still required to do in-service training on dyslexia. This legislation was meant to tackle the pre-service. And as Ellen said, there are still some questions and concerns about the interpretation of this legislation, and so you'll have to wait for some guidance from us. And as she says, just pause on this one and put it aside for the moment. So in terms of professional learning, um, CERC has been kind enough to keep track since 2015 when we did our um, first uh, release of a website on SLD dyslexia, and we started doing our professional training. Um, the first bar is the accumulation of visitors to that website. The next bar is the one that I think I'm most proud of. We did our first webinar in March of 2015, and at that webinar, we had 800 people register. To date, there have been 3,960 people who have uh, access that particular webinar. So we have tried to do professional development that is archived, either webinars that are archives, case studies, online modules, so that you and your district people can access those as you need them, and they're pretty classic information. It's not information that's going to change from year to year. 
And so I think you can see with the rest of the bars, I'll let you read those on your own, but people are continuing to use those and I hear about um, people using them in staff meetings, people, individual teachers using them for their own professional development. Even some parents are accessing this um, professional development information. So one of our big tasks over the last year and a half, or last year and into this year, is revising the guidelines for identifying children with learning disabilities. We are updating it. We are adding some of current research. I did put out a request to you as directors at least twice and have gotten some great feedback in terms of uh, updating the forms and making them more usable. So there will be new forms or revision of the forms coming out, not new forms, but just a revision. And we will be including uh, more information on dyslexia in the guidelines and making it a more user-friendly book. Um, the questions that I get about dyslexia, 99% of them are in the guidelines. So I would encourage you and your staff to use that document. It has a lot of great information and it will have more. We're anticipating, um, let's say, a mid-fall mid release and there will be a webinar on the implementation of the new guidelines and the new forms, which will then be able to be archived for the rest of you to access if you couldn't make it into the webinar. So that's our primary project. And the second one is we're developing a parent's guide to SLD dyslexia in Connecticut, which will be an electronic document that will have lots of videos and links and so forth that parents can access, and it will be posted on both the CERC and the SDE website. We also have gotten some feedback from people in the field and the um, SLD dyslexia assessment resource guide that we put out last year, which I use all the time. Um, we have over 15 new assessments that will be added to that document, and that one will be coming out um, early this fall. So the rest of this information are some professional development opportunities that are coming along. Um, we have a new case study that I understand was just posted. It's on a secondary student going from middle school up through high school. Um, by Louise Spears Swirling, that's available as a, a, a case study. Uh, we have two new online modules. One is in the process of being recorded and I presented on it yesterday at the uh, Performance Matters Conference here on identifying students who are gifted and talented and also have SLD dyslexia. And it was a very interesting learning process for us to go through that module. And then we have another module coming about, uh, about SLD dyslexia and students who are English learners. And that one is um, in, in the process of being edited and will be out in the mid middle of the fall. And then I mentioned to you the webinar about the guidelines. We, this year, we're going to be trying to find a speaker that can speak to math and learning disabilities and dyslexia. And that will be presented in a webinar that will again be out, um, archived. We've also collaborated, CERC has collaborated with Reading Horizons, which I brought in last year as another option to look at a more phonics-based program that's computer-based that you can use along with some of your um, already existing reading training. And they're coming in to, to do a one-day, their level one training so that people who are uh, using these materials will be trained and certified according to their, their calculations in terms of um, their program. And um, Donna Merritt at CERC is going to be repeating two sessions that were overbooked last year for speech and language uh, professionals on their roles in looking at uh, students with SLD dyslexia. Those will be repeated again this year. This is another list of other options. Orton-Gillingham, Wilson, many of the Wilson programs, they CERC offered them last year. They will be offered again this year. I know CREC is also offering some again this year. These are just the opportunities that you may need to get your staff trained and up and running to implement the uh, structured literacy that all of these students who have SLD or SLD dyslexia need um, to improve and, and learn, learn how to read. Uh, in addition, um, 
We are contracting with CREC to put out a structured literacy guide, which will give you all of the different structured literacy programs and all of their components, so you can look at them across the board and determine which ones are best for which students in your district. CREC is also bringing in a wonderful person named David Kip. Kilpatrick, who is the author of Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. And as I get that information, I will send that out to you. And then we have two options for uh, a multiple day structured literacy or structured language training, which looks at all of the components of training. CREX is offering one, a four day program. And Dr. Margie Gillis, through Literacy How, is also offering another session, which is five days. So more information about those will be coming out if you need to find uh, extensive professional learning for your staff. This is also another list of trainings that are coming out through CREC. CREC is bringing in some strategies instruction from the University of Kansas in various areas. Um, that are particularly targeted at the secondary level and secondary students. There's also a session on assistive technology and again, the Wilson training that CREC is going to be offering as well. So you can see there's not only a lot of archived information, but there's also a lot of new information that's coming out there that you don't even have to leave your building to access. But one of the things that I did send out, and I have sent out a couple of times, unlike my transition hat where I have thousands of people on my dissemination list, when you're trying to get information out about SLD dyslexia, the only group I can contact is special ed directors. So I developed an Excel form, which you will find posted on the uh, CERC website, that all you have to do is type in names, district, and an email address and I will add them to an SLD dyslexia dissemination list. I've probably only heard from about a third of you and this, this, this list is not just for special ed. Your reading teachers, your literacy coaches, your school psychologists, anyone who wants information on SLD dyslexia, just send me this list and they will automatically be added. So I encourage you to do that so more of your staff are getting information about the professional learning that's going on and any changes that we have that are coming along. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'd like to introduce Mr. John Flanders, who is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center where CPAC is one of our partners to help, that helps support our work that we do on behalf of all students and the families. I even get a slide. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, like Steve said, I'm John Flanders and I'm here from CPAC. Uh, for those of you who don't know, CPAC is the PTI, the Parent Training and Information Center for the state of Connecticut. We're an organization mandated by IDEA uh, to provide training and support so that parents can be the most effective collaborators in their children's education uh, as possible. So I want to tell you a little bit about us. We've had a pretty good year. Uh, in the last year, we fielded requests for information from about 3,000 people, parents uh, as well as professionals. We conducted 108 training sessions, both parent training and professional development. Uh, to help people understand the process and various elements, and we encourage you to use us for those purposes. Uh, we've had some growth. We have added three new parent consultants in the past year. Uh, we have opened a new satellite office in conjunction with our friends at St. Joseph's Parenting Center uh, in Stanford. So we're very happy to be out there and certainly want to know, want you folks in Fairfield County to know that we are in your area and available to you. Um, our Next Steps program, which are, is our intensive parent leadership training program, uh, will start in Waterbury uh, on October 2nd and runs for eight weeks, or actually nine weeks, because we got Columbus Day in there. 
Uh, and we will, for the first time, be introducing uh, parent leadership training and next steps entirely in Spanish, which will take place in New Haven this year uh, and we will be setting up shortly. I wanted to talk to you uh, about a couple of new things that we're doing. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it was Oscar Wilde that, that said that uh, the United States and Britain are two nations separated by a common language. And uh, I think that that is, applies to special educators and parents as well. Our job is to make sure that that communication goes through well. So a new initiative that we are offering uh, today or, uh, is to help participate in when you are having difficult conversations. Our normal role in those is when a parent is having a difficult conversation with you, they call us and ask for our help. We're offering our help to you. If you would like someone to come in as an honest broker to help interpret what's going on and a chance to have, an, an uh, I won't call it an impartial opinion, but a, a non-school related opinion on what's going on to help you move forward with, that, with those con difficult conversations, we are available and I strongly encourage you to, uh, to contact us. Uh, the other is, uh, when you came in, you noticed a CPAC uh, tent on your table. Several people came back to me and said that they thought we had uh, reserved all of the tables in the room. <laughs> I want you to know how thrilled I am that our influence is at the point where you think our 15-person staff can occupy this whole room. <laughs> uh, what it is is a request for information from you. As I said, communication is the core of what we do. So when we do training, when we do communication, we're going to do it the best way if we have input from both the parent side and the, and the school side so that we are getting the information with a broad-based perspective. We are asking you to help us. On all of your tables, you will find a little sticky pad and by our table out in the hall, you will find a big board. If there is some part of training, if there is some part of information that you think that we can provide, either as professional development or as parent training that will help move these conversations forward, we beg you, please write it down, stick it on the board. We'll be using that in helping prepare all of our new trainings uh, upcoming, and, and including professional development training for those of you who want it. And hopefully we will be able to provide training and support that opens up the conversation, that maximizes the communication that takes place between you and that mom or dad who's sitting in the room with you. Uh, they gave me a very short time and I don't want to uh, impinge on Carl's time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have six or seven of our parent consultants strewn around in the room. Please take the time to talk to us, tell us what you think, ask us questions, that's what we're here for, and thank you. Thank you, John. Another critical partner in our work together is Concase. So I'd like to introduce Carl Gross, who's the president of Concase. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, I really enjoyed, I'm sure we all did, uh, Brian's presentation this morning. But I have to admit a little bit of video envy, and Mike Tavernier is the only one in this room who can back me up on this. I had selected a short video clip to share with you guys this morning. It was a few minutes of the Kenny Chesney concert I went to this summer at Mohegan Sun. It was one of my summer highlights, and I was only going to share it because I wanted all of you to think back for a moment to your summer highlight. Uh, because we all enjoy that quality time off during the summer. Uh, but in the interest of time, we bagged that. And to tell you the truth, some of his lyrics were a little sketchy, so it's probably just us as well. Uh, so instead, I'll direct your attention to our first announcement, your, your state association's first announcement. Take a look at this October conference that's coming up in just a few weeks. This is going to be a great conference. We have double keynote speakers. This is on the 12th and on the 13th at the Farmington Marriott. And on Thursday, we have Dr. Ross Green, who's speaking to collaborative problem solving. 
with students with challenging behaviors, and many of you are familiar with Dr. Green's work. And on Friday, we have a second keynote, which is Dr. Eric Frazier speaking to threat and risk assessment in a school setting. Um, I had the pleasure of bringing Dr. Frazier up a few years ago to our district, and a few surrounding districts participated. He was phenomenal. People were saying it was the best PD that they had in years. We also have a few breakouts. We have a couple breakout sessions, which will include a panel discussion of best practices with students who have suffered severe trauma. Uh, so if you have not made a note, if you have not signed up, if you have not registered, I can't encourage you enough. We're also very pleased to be working so closely, and, and Steve has alluded to this, where we've been working so closely with the Special Education Bureau and with CERC in the design of your leadership forums. And you'll see on the December date, December 12th, that session will be entirely devoted to new special education directors. Uh, so what a terrific opportunity to address the particular concerns and conversations that those folks who are new special administrators can have for the day. The February topic is still in process, and you'll note that the March topic, as, as is typical, um, returns to legal matters. The difference being this spring that it's a two-day event and we're so pleased to have returning to us one of our keynotes from last year, attorney Melinda Jacobs will be part of that event. I also want to mention to you that uh, I don't have to tell you that these are tough times for us politically and financially. Uh, these are times in Washington where finding people who can understand our point of view on education uh, is not an easy task. But two of our board members have been down to Washington this past year, Kathy Gabrielson and Pauline Smith, and they've been down there fighting for us. And every month, the Concase board gets together, we review and we respond to a range of critical state legislative and state agency initiatives on your behalf. And so that's why, just for a moment, I would like to, as we typically do, Ask my colleagues on the board to please stand up if there are any concase board members. I think there's a cluster in the back corner there that are hiding out, perhaps. If, uh, if the concase board members can stand up, and we want to say thank you. Thank, thank you for your work. Um, I came across a proverb that I wanted to share with you, which is a thousand days of diligent study does not even compare or is not as great as one day with a great teacher. And this struck me because despite the challenges we're facing, despite the particular political and financial challenges we'll face this year, you all know and you all work with great teachers. And you are all great teachers with your staff. So that's why with confidence, despite those challenges, we at Concase, we in the Concase board, can with confidence wish you a very productive and a very happy new year. And I hope to see you in October. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Hello? Okay. So you can probably see the panic on my face now, but um, I would just like to take a moment to thank two truly amazing consultants that have worked for the state, Gail Mangs and Maria Sinodi, who have just impacted so many lives for the positive in the field of education, uh, both in early childhood and due process. So I want to wish them the best and thank them for their many years of service. If you can all join me in a round of applause for Gail and Maria. Maria. Irreplaceable, but we will do our best. Thank you again. 
So I'd like to leave you at this point with a special treat. We have a very special guest with us. Her name is Jasmine. She's a high school senior. I met Jasmine at the luncheon that I mentioned at the Yukon Youth Leadership Forum. And Jasmine will share a little bit of her keyboarding ability with us um, to send us to our breakout sessions. I just want to thank all of the people, again, that were involved with um, putting together this, this session for us today. Mike Tavernier as the lead at the State Department of Education. Thanks again, Mike. And I'd like to take, thank Steve Prophet and Sir Consultants for their work to help support our work. And everyone else involved, thank you very much. Jasmine. As I mentioned, Jasmine's a high school senior at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. And she's here to share her talents with us. I'm sorry, uh, just, just as Jasmine gets set up, I'd like to introduce John and Stephanie, uh, who, are, who knew Jasmine well, and I appreciate all the logistics they did to help. Just a, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is John Gentile. I'm the president and founder of the Connecticut Youth Leadership Project, which is the parent organization for the Connecticut Youth Leadership Forum. We'll be going into our 20th year next year. And I, some of you folks know who we are and some of you folks don't. I'm gonna hand off to Stephanie to identify our website and how you can access us for your uh, high school sophomores and, and um, juniors. Thank you, John, and thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be here today. So our website is www.ctylp.org. And in December, the applications will be available for your students with disabilities to participate in the forum. It's not a UConn forum, it's a Connecticut Youth Leadership Forum that is conducted at UConn. And Pat has been terrific in getting our applications out to you in the, in the past, and uh, it's a great forum. Jasmine is one example, and we hope your students will participate next year. Do I need to do a, a song and dance while waiting? Thank you.
Wow, that was incredible. I'm always so impressed with such great talent. Really, really awesome. Okay, so that concludes our general session, and what a great way to end.